to another edition of the Kingdom War Room. I'm Dr. Michael Ike. I'm the co-host with uh, Dr. Mike Spaulding, and I'm going to introduce this today a little bit different uh, than I normally do. I, I told uh, Dr. Mike that I'm kind of reflective uh, today on some things that are going on in my life. Now, one of the things that we try to do with the Kingdom War Room is we we try to bring in some of our colleagues to have a roundtable discussion, almost like we're we're doing a virtual coffee with each other. Uh, discussing research, discussing maybe a new book that we've come out. Uh, in fact, in the days ahead, uh, I envision us maybe having two or three more guests on than we have now, and maybe even discussing issues to where it goes beyond our new book or our, our new documentary, and, and to really uh, hit some hard-hitting issues because, man, we're facing issues uh, like never before that I think that maybe uh, even the early church has not had to deal with, especially when we get into the the return of the watchers and and so many of these things. And uh, I always, I all personally, like when I introduce myself, hey, I'm Dr. Mike Lake. Just look me up on Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. I don't like talking about me. I like talking about Jesus. And uh, if you're watching this show, you know about me. You know doc, about Dr. Mike Spaulding and how that I'm constantly trying to keep up with the writing as many books as he does. But that's just a, a whole other thing. And uh, uh, Mike's website is uh, drmikespalding.com. Today, we're fortunate enough to have on the show a, a good friend of mine, Josh Peck. And I remember, Josh, the first time we met, you had come through and just a, a fledgling writer. And uh, I have been tacitly watching in the background uh, to see the giftings that God has placed within you really develop. And man, it's been a blessing to me. I, I've seen you that uh, you have come out with some awesome books. In fact, one of them we're going to be discussing today. Uh, you're working down with Skywatch TV. And and I really see the uh, kind of a nurturing environment down there uh, to cause your giftings to flourish. I mean, that's that's very obvious. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Scott, yeah, Skywatch is awesome. But I, you know, I owe a big thanks to you, too, because I don't I, Tom Horn may not even have known who I was had it not been for you giving in my books in the first place. So I, I really appreciate that. But uh, yeah, it's 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 great here. Well, I, you know, the spirit of God spoke to me and, and Mary both and said that's kind of where he needs to be. So I was just I planted a seed and, and God took it on. But I, I've seen you not only uh, flourish as an uh, researcher and author, but as a uh, 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 documentarian or how, documentary producer, whatever the, the term is, uh, with your one on Silent Cry. And uh, I'm not really trying to plug that with this one, but guys, if you if you have not gotten it, have, have not gotten that and watched it, you need to. It's about child trafficking. And what was amazing to me is that you two pulled it off for hate speech. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's kind of like what the pimps would do if you start talking about prostitution. Yep. <laughs> you know, oh, this is hate speech. No, hate is what you do. Um, but uh, in fact, I think your main uh, website is dailyrenegade.com. Is that the main one that you use all the time? Yeah, yeah, for, for myself. And then there's uh, skywatchtv.com for, uh, for Skywatch. Okay. Now with your current book, and guys, it's, it's entitled The Lost Prophecies of Qumran dealing with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in fact, I was telling Josh before we uh, started today that, uh, you know, I, I have I have frustrations when you're dealing with bits and pieces instead of the whole dialogue. And I was glad that uh, God anointed him to go through it all. And, uh, and guys, what I'm seeing in the body of Christ is everybody has unique giftings. And in this hour, God is causing all of them to flourish. And we, we need to cherish the giftings of each other, respect those giftings, and, and benefit from the giftings of one another. None of us are in competition. This, this is all for Jesus, and it's all for the kingdom. And uh, you bring up the Essenes, uh, and, and many people, many Christians don't even know who the Essenes are. They're, they're kind of like an overlooked group in the Second Temple period. Although there is a, a, there are many connections to what was actually going on in the New Testament and the Gospels that is kind of hidden uh, in the dialogue unless you really know what, what's going on. Uh, in fact, they believed that um, uh, because of all the corruption in Jerusalem, they went onto the desert and, and set up their own camp. And uh, because they, and, and in fact, it's from the Dead Sea Scrolls that we have one of the best descriptions of the Second Temple period, temple, uh, from their writings. But they didn't stop there. They have a lot of, of prophetic things that they wrote about. I think that's what you're bringing in today, Josh. And I do want to thank you to the show. I'm excited about what we're talking about. 
why don't we start with who were the Essenes? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and thank you so much, both of you, for having me on. It's always a blessing for me to, to be able to talk to you guys. But uh, yeah, this is such an interesting topic. The, the Essenes, they were formed around the same time as the Pharisees and Sadducees. Um, and uh, like you said, th this would have been a couple hundred years, three, four hundred years before Christ. They, they believed that the Pharisees and Sadducees had become corrupt. Uh, so they formed a settlement in Qumran. And of course, we're, we're brushing past a lot of history here, but um, some of it's actually kind of hard to track down. Uh, there, there's still some things that we, we don't really know. But from what we do know, they, they eventually formed a settlement in Qumran. They wrote and kept the Dead Sea Scrolls. A lot of that was from the Temple Library, but they had some of their own writings in there too. Um, so the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were, were basically that Qumran collection. You have all the books of the Bible uh, that were found in there, except uh, Esther, I believe, and, um, and a lot of extra biblical books, so such as Enoch was in there, Jubilees, uh, and several others. And um, they were still around, the Essenes were still around during the time of Christ. So this gets into what's called the 400 silent years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, time between the Old and New, um, time between the Old and New, oh, sorry. No, it's okay, Mike Spalding jumped in and out and that's the wonders of Microsoft and Skype. Oh, okay. sometimes. sorry about that. I didn't know if my microphone was was uh, making some noise or something. Anyway, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the time between the Old and the New Testaments, uh, much of that's still a mystery, but we know that the Old Testament ends with Malachi, and then the New Testament opens with Matthew, and it seems like everything's different at that point. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, came into existence uh, during these 400 years between the Old and the New Testaments. Um, so we can actually use them to help tell us what happened uh, during that time, that, that 400 years. So before the Dead Sea Scrolls, we only had some scattered parts of the Talmud and uh, uh, four books of the Maccabees and Josephus to tell us what happened between the Testaments. But now that we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find out that there's a, a lot more in there. And a lot of this is brand new. I mean, this stuff didn't really start even getting into uh, like public translations and stuff till about the 90s. And even with that, there was a lot of stuff with their calendar, which I'm sure we'll talk about today too. There was stuff with their calendar that was only recently, like within the past couple of years, uh, discovered. So the, the, this is, it, while the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves are very new, this this kind of, or, or are very old, excuse me, this study is actually pretty new uh, relative to the past 2000 years or so. So it's, it's really exciting stuff. You know, when you, yeah. when you look at it with the, um, with the Essenes, this is going on and they're being developed at the same time. Antiochus Epiphanes comes down and subjugates all of Judea. And then you have all the horrors and, and, you know, some Christians don't even know about that, but to, to be able to go through all this, and there, there are a lot of academic scholarly things that have really helped with validating the translations that we have for some of the prophets that actually the Dead Sea Scrolls popped out and, and do the same thing. In fact, uh, I know Doug Woodward has done a lot of work on, on looking at the Septuagint and actually some of the Dead Sea Scrolls things come out and show that uh, with, with his hypothesis that, uh, oh, what's his face? Um, oh, I hate that when I lose stuff. But there's there, I mean, there's a chance that the Old Testament was actually altered uh, in the in the in the second and third century by a group because they were wanting to obfuscate who Messiah was, and so they changed the timelines. The timelines are actually longer and everything. And many of the things of the Dead Sea Scrolls actually validated what was represented in the Septuagint over the Masoretic text. And so when I think one of the things that is kind of a frustrum for all of us is just how slow scholarship and the academic community go. You know, we we want them to at least hit 20 miles an hour, but they're they're like that Sunday driver that never takes their car over 15 miles an hour because they're afraid they can't get it to stop or something. You know, and and that's the way that the many that's why this stuff has been slow going and much of it's tedious. Yeah. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's what a lot of people uh, don't don't realize too is th these aren't like scrolls that are just rolled up and you can just open them and read them. These are little bits of paper, uh, frag fragmented just for being two thousand years old. You know, the paper is degraded and fallen apart. And uh, there's pictures of them online that people can look at, but they are they are difficult to read and piece together. Um, I, I largely relied on other people's uh, translation work for that because I don't I don't know Hebrew. I don't know how to read or speak it uh, or Greek or anything. Uh, I know English and I know bad English and that's about it. <laughs> so uh, people like Ken Johnson, Dr. Ken Johnson was a, a huge help with a lot of this uh, research. And uh, he actually wrote the foreword to the book. Um, and then there's several other, there's a lot of translations of full, like full sets of like Dead Sea Scroll translations that people can pick up too. And like Bible translations, I recommend getting a, a couple different kinds because any any translation is gonna have the translator's biases in there, you know, whether they mean to or not. Um, and the Dead Sea Scrolls are no different. So just like how you can have, you know, a KJV or an ESV or an NIV or, you know, all these translations, the Dead Sea Scrolls is a little like that too. So each translator kind of, I, I like having like three or four and then looking up the same thing and, and trying to get like a gist of, of what's being said. But the good thing is the translations are pretty close. I haven't really seen any that's like, you know, some translator is going off into left field and making wild translations or anything. So far, it seems pretty close. So I think if uh, if, if anybody was interested in the topic, they could probably pick up um, any one of them and, and it would be a good start. Or like you said, they can get my book and uh, I I have a lot of that in there for, for people. So, yeah. All right, Dr. Mike, is there some things you want to add here? Well, I was just going to say that um, it, it, it is very tedious work and it, people don't have an appreciation for what scholars are doing with the Dead Sea Scrolls until they actually see the Dead Sea Scroll. I remember several years ago, um, they had portions of them. They, they were traveling around to different museums, and, and uh, so they arrived in Cincinnati, and Kathy and I went down to, to go through the exhibit and to see them, and I was, I was actually stunned at how small they were and, and what, what work, uh, meticulous work would have to go into to being very certain what it is that is being said, because that's, that's a big part of it, right? Being yeah. very certain about that. And then, uh, and I think that's so, so the second point is this, that's why it goes so slow because you want to be certain what it says and you're conveying what it actually says because there's so many and thank you for doing this in your book by the way Josh there's so many people out there that want to elevate the Dead Sea Scrolls to a place with the scriptures and and then they start they take off and they well we've all seen it very fanciful tales about why we should be doing this or that or the other thing so that's just a couple of observations I appreciated that you took the time to do that Oh yeah, absolutely. Because it it is a real temptation when you when you read through the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're stunning, and uh, I mean they're they're beautifully written. I mean the stuff that we have that we can actually see it's it's fragmented, so we're missing a lot of words. But um, there there is a real temptation, and people fall into it of elevating the Essenes or elevating the Dead Sea Scrolls to the level of scripture. And uh, right right in the beginning of the book, I advise the reader against that kind of thing because. Well, that's how cults can, can get started, but uh, but also while the Essenes were amazing and they had they had accurate prophecy. They they knew who the Messiah was going to be, you know, what to look for. So many of them accepted Jesus right away, uh, but they weren't perfect. You know, they were still human beings. The the, the way that I look at it, because I, I get asked this sometimes, like was Jesus an Essene? And I would say Jesus wasn't an Essene. Jesus was Jesus, but it just happened to be at that time the Essenes had the closest theology that matched what Jesus was teaching. So it's not that Jesus was an Essene. It's it would be like you know if if Jesus came back today, there's going to be one denomination. Like no denominations are perfect, but there's going to be one that's probably like closer than the other ones are. You know what one there's going to be one on the top of that stack. So. Uh, I, I think the Essenes were kind of like that, but again, they weren't perfect. Uh, there were certain things that they needed to be taught, like about love and and uh, and forgiveness and things like that. 
but uh, so I wanted to address that right away because again, it, it's really easy for people to take this kind of stuff and then almost make an entirely new religion out of it and, and, and turn it into something that was never meant to be, you know, for, for us in modern day America and stuff like that. So there's a lot we can glean, a lot we can learn, um, but, uh, you know, a lot of their practices and stuff, we wouldn't want to be sacrificing animals and things like that. So th there is a line. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, we, we tend to romance things, you know, the, uh, you know, especially when you start dealing with the apostles or, or anybody else, you know, the only one perfect in the Bible was Jesus. That's right. And you can, you can romance him because no matter how much you shine him up and, and make him gleam, we're still falling short of, of this really who he was. Because John said, listen, if I wrote everything that he ever did, the world's not big enough to hold all the books. Yep. But anybody yep. else, uh, they have warts, they have moles, they have, they have bad days, good days. Uh, the Apostle Paul got in an argument and divided up his ministry team. And I mean, just all kinds of things. And we, we tend to forget that, but they're just regular Joes like you and I are, that we're just trying their best in the mess of who they were to serve God. That's absolutely right. And uh, in fact, one of the parables, Dr. Brad Young in one of his books brings up that uh, the parable of Jesus was that basically concluded that the children of the world are wiser than the children of the kingdom. That was that that parable was actually appointed at the Essenes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, and so, you know, the, the Essenes, there's a lot of good data that we can extrapolate. Uh, uh, John the Baptist, in, in, which we'll talk about next, was actually connected to the Essenes. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, there's several reasons to 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 believe that this is the case. And I think this is the most likely uh, scenario that John, John the Baptist was actually in a scene. So first, the Essenes believed that they were going to fulfill Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, about the voice crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. That was like their thing. That was that was what they were really um, that was like their mission. They knew they knew that they were going to fulfill that. Uh, so, of course, we know that John the Baptist fulfilled that. So there's a connection there. Um, but that was a big part of why they went out to Qumran in the first place. We also find out that um, John was a fulfillment of that prophecy uh, from Isaiah 40, verse 3. Also, strangely enough, there's no weird detail in Scripture that's put in there by accident. You know, like Dr. Michael Heiser says, if it's weird, you should pay attention to it. Uh, scripture makes note that John had a diet of locusts, and it seems just like this weird detail uh, just thrown in there, but I think there was actually a reason because, um, as I show in the book, locusts in that time were actually not a common food in, in Israel, except for in Qumran, in the Qumran community, and we actually find instructions on how to prepare locusts for food in the Dead Sea Scrolls, so there's another connection there. Um, what, one, of, one I think is one of the most interesting is that John's father worked in the temple, but for some reason we don't see John following that tradition at the temple. So the Essenes were actually known for accepting other people's children into their community and raising them as their own. Uh, so maybe John actually went to go live with the Essenes. Now, why would this happen? Well, if if John's father is working in the temple, then he's probably at that time part of that corrupt system. Then the angel comes and tells him what's going to happen. Remember, he didn't believe it. He lost his voice. Well, I think at that point, uh, once he got his voice back and realized what was going on, he realized the Essenes actually had it right. I need to send my son there and get a proper education and what's actually true instead of here at the temple. So uh, that, that's a possibility. We don't know for sure because the, uh, scripture doesn't tell us, but uh, th there's a lot of connections like that that seem, when you take them all together, seem to be too much of a coincidence. So um, baptism was a, another big deal for the Essenes. Uh, John was baptizing before Jesus came on the scenes, uh, came on the came on the scene. But the Essenes were known for frequent ritual bathings, and that's even not not only in their own texts, but even outside texts like Josephus and uh, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, there's there's other connections that I put in the book, but I think those are like the top like three or four that that kind of make me think. I I think there's something going on there. You know, there's a lot of scholars, too, that believe that after uh, uh, John the Baptist's father was killed because they actually were after John because they, he was actually the number one suspect to become the Messiah. Yeah. And, and many scholars believe that him and his mother, after, after his father was killed, fled to the Essenes and lived among them. So he was actually raised in that environment. Now, look at the, look at the providence of God. Yeah. You had an entire community be established 
that basically centered up on the calling of who John the Baptist was so that after his father was killed, that he was raised among them uh, the rest of his life until God released him in ministry. And I remember back in, I guess it was about 2005, I was at a yeshiva down in Arkansas where they bring in scholars from all over the world. And one of the guys sitting at my table was this scholar they brought in on the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? And it's one of those things where I wish I'd have had a tape recorder uh, for a lot of it. But one of the things uh, he said was that uh, many believe that the Essenes were the keepers of the of the Talit or mantle of Elijah. Yeah, yeah. And that we actually find that in some extra biblical sources as well. There's actually a list that I include in the book from an ancient source that lists all of the leaders of the schools, the school of the prophets that we read about in, in the Old Testament. Well, apparently that school of the prophets continued and John the Baptist was the leader of it. The, I, I guess that would be the last one unless it continued after that. Well, I mean, there were prophets after that, so possibly it did. But the last one that we know about, at least, that we can pinpoint um, uh, was John the Baptist. But yeah, there's ancient uh, records uh, having the whole list of names. But yeah, I included that in the book. It's really interesting to, to, to think about that, that that school of the prophets continued continued in Qumran specifically, and that John the Baptist was most likely the, the, the leader of that, of that school of the prophets. And, and the absolute sovereignty of God had a community prepared for him that was prophetic in nature, that was yep. connected to the school of the prophets that he was raised in. And then when he left, they had been the custodians of the mantle of Elijah to give him so that he literally came in the mantle and the spirit of Elijah when 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 he was released into ministry, and yeah. you, you start going over thousands of years between you know all the all this time between Elijah and now, and in God's sovereignty, all of that was kept. Uh, one of the things that reassures me in the days ahead is no matter what the enemy does, no matter what the elite are trying to do with the jab or whatever else comes next or or the, the world reset, you know, it doesn't matter. It's not going to take God by surprise. God has a way of making a place for his people for the things that he needs when he needs them to be released. And Antiochus Epiphanes couldn't get to it. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't get to it. I mean, this all uh, Babylon couldn't get to it. All these things could not get to destroy what God needed in this season, it was to be released. And that that, bring, that brings real comfort to me that uh, God has a purpose, God has a plan, and my job is to find that plan and stay in that purpose. Because when I do, there's provision, there's protection, there's guidance, there's all these wonderful things that we have as a believer. And, uh, and I think that that should give hope to every believer that's listening to the show. Oh, amen, me too, absolutely. Amen. So, Josh, would you consider um, the Dead Sea Scrolls lost Jewish history? Yeah, this is actually one of the most important reasons that I wanted to write this book, because right now, uh, most Jewish people are either secular or they're orthodox, which actually comes from uh, Pharisee teaching, and they, they don't know that there's actually this other option, there, this very Jewish option. Uh, and it, it, it's it's there's an extremely rich history uh, full of honor and obedience to God, what it really means to 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 be a Jew at that time. I mean, th this is completely Jewish history, but unfortunately, a lot of Jewish people today don't have access to it or or don't even know it's there um, because e even even some of the scholarly work that gets uh, that the Dead Sea Scrolls ha has attached to it, every every scholar, every theologian, they're all going to have their spin. For example, in, in one of one of the translation books that I actually really like a lot, in the introduction, it said that uh, the Essenes were communist. They weren't communist. <laughs> like um, communist is a, a government structure imposed on people. They they were a community of of believers and uh, brothers that helped each other out and shared stuff. You know, like a community would. But uh, to call it communist, it would be would be a stretch. So you get you get that kind of stuff too. So because of all of that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, by and large, Jewish people don't have access to this part of their history. So I feel, I, I believe that there's going to come a very strong Jewish revival uh, in the future. And I believe we read about that in scripture. And I, I think that the, the, the knowledge of the Dead Sea Scrolls 
just uh, the history that's in there, I think that that could inspire this this great revival. If we can help the Jewish people reclaim their history, they'll be more likely to consider Jesus because the Essenes immediately knew who Jesus was when he came and accepted him. And we're giving them something that's not Christianity by name, you know, it's, it's, it's a scene, I guess. But when you really look at the uh, history, what they believed, it leads right to Christ. And so I, I think if we do that, it gives them something where they don't have to say, oh, well, I don't want to listen to a goofy Christian. Uh, but if it's actual Jewish history, hey, maybe they'll maybe they'll be more likely to, to read something like that. So I'm hoping my book can play a small part in that. But that, that was the main reason that I wanted to write it is is there's a whole section of Jewish history that's uh, gone lost. You know, and I, I think one of the things that helps me, um, you know, and when I began awakening to my Hebraic heritage, one of the things that I was uh, kind of dismayed to discover is that modern rabbinics bears no resemblance to first century Phariseeism even. Uh, that right. it, has, yeah. it has amalgamated. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 Encyclopedia Judaica admits that modern rabbinics is a blending of Judaism, Hinduism, and a lot of other isms. Yeah. And to, to a great degree, uh, what is seen among the Essenes can be an avenue for them to return to a pure form of Judaism, which opens the door for them to realize who Messiah is. Absolutely. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Now, uh, I think one of the things we need to talk about is their calendar. I get almost emails uh, once a week about the Essene calendar. What do you think about it? And I'm thinking, okay, what calendar now? Because it's it, within the Messianic movement, there's so many calendars floating around, yeah. you know, and, and that, you know, that uh, the Sabbath is not the Sabbath. And then there's the, the new moon. They know it's not the moon. It's this, it's this, you know, it's the sun calendar and, and uh, just every kind of crazy thing that you can think of is floating around. And uh, now the Essenes had a different calendar than even the second temple period uh, Judaism had, didn't they? Yeah, and th this is what I love about their calendar too, is it's so simple. <laughs> and, uh, and and to me, it's like if there's an original calendar that we can actually know, I think this is the best bet for, for that calendar. So according to the Essenes, they were actually using the original calendar that God gave to Adam. Uh, the Essenes would say that the calendar of the Pharisees uh, was pagan and corrupt. Um, apparently, sometime during the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes or possibly uh, Antipater, the Jewish leadership were required to uh, use a pagan lunar calendar. It, it was, it, from what we can kind of piece together, it was sort of like, well, you can still do your Jewish stuff, but you got to use our calendar. Now, some went along with it, some didn't, but eventually the leadership in Israel did adopt the the pagan calendar the, the that, that's based on the moon. Um, there's even prophecies in the book of Jubilees that talks about when ancient Jewish leadership would abandon the the, the real calendar in favor for uh, a corrupt pagan calendar. So the Essenes claimed to have kept the original uh, calendar, which which makes it really interesting. And and again, when you look at it, it's it's really beautiful. It feels complete, but it's still simple and easy to follow. Um, and when I say follow, I don't mean like we're required to do the rituals and things that they did. You know, they had sacrifices and stuff. But I mean, it's an easy calendar to learn and, and kind of, uh, you know, look for certain dates and see what might have fallen on on uh, like uh, historical events on, on Jewish dates and stuff. Uh, actually, there's a really good resource if people want to go see this online. They can go to uh, DSSCalendar.org. That's uh, Dr. Ken Johnson uh, put that together. Uh, and then we also have a print version uh, available on there too, if people want that. But uh, it's really easy to read, and and yeah, it's it's, I, I like I like the simplicity of it. <laughs> yeah. Now you know I've I've not done a lot of researching with that calendar, you know, with when you look at the biblical calendar, the way that Moses had set it up, and there was actually a resetting of the calendar uh, by Moses that corresponded with them being set free from uh, from Egypt that they based upon the abib barley harvest that you could actually have 13 months uh in it because you you had eight our bet because if, if the harvest was not ripe enough then you would wait an extra month for it because it, it corresponded with with the prophetic image of a lot of things that the feast had was that calculated and in, into their calendar at all um i actually don't know I, every everywhere that i've uh looked for 
evidence of the Essene calendar in the Bible. Uh, I, I've looked in several places and I've found it. That that one specifically, I haven't compared, so I'm not I'm not sure. Uh, but there are several uh, other places. If if you try to map out the events of Noah's flood, for example, on any other calendar, because we get a lot of uh, you know day counts and stuff in the in the Noah's flood, you know, 150 days, so the water receded and all this stuff. Um, on any other calendar, it, it doesn't work. You'll, you'll always end up a day or two off somewhere. But on the Essene calendar, it actually matches perfectly. What what made the Essene calendar unique is it's it's 364 days, but they have what are called tukufas. So there's four kind of like non-day days. They're like divisions in between the seasons. So there's four of those. So it's it's a 360 plus four <laughs> uh, calendar. But when you when you use that uh, with with the takufas and everything, it, it matches. Even same with the events of Moses and his meeting with God. The day counts. Uh, I haven't been able to find another calendar where they work, but uh, it works on the Essene calendar. Uh, most re relevant to us um, is I believe that you could actually use that prophetically. We know we got a lot of day counts in prophecy as well. So I go through several options prophetically, and I say options because it's prophecy. It hasn't ha happened yet. So in a way, we're you know we're kind of like who knows. But uh, I go I go through some options with that. But uh, but even just the historical stuff, um, the ones that I've I've compared it to, it, it seems to work out really well. Yeah. So so Josh, is the calendar that uh, that the Jewish people are using today is that accurate? Because people are going to be asking that question now that since we broached this subject and and if it isn't, who's got an accurate calendar? Right. Yeah. So every calendar is a little different. The modern the modern Jewish calendar um, has uh, have has some issues. It's a little complicated. And to be honest, our calendar is is uh, you know what we use here in America is is really complicated too. Especially when it comes to leap days or leap weeks or leap months. So we 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 have a we have a leap day. You know, every four years. Um, we have a, a an extra day, but there's actually more provisions to that. It's like it's something I have it in the book. It's something like every four years, unless it's a hundredth year or a four hundredth year, in which case you do this other thing. And so our system's complicated. Uh, the modern Jewish system, they have a leap month, so they'll they'll add an extra month and um, and and things like that. So I I don't think anybody really has a correct calendar if if there's any cor correct one as in this is what day it is and this is how to keep everything in order i i i would i would say the essene calendar but you know i'm pretty biased on that and i certainly haven't studied every calendar but uh but yeah i, I don't i don't think any of them really got it right except for uh the the essene or dead sea scroll calendar yeah well i, I think the modern jewish calendar when you look back at the development of it uh, because biblically, it requires them to be living in the land so they can have that abib barley harvest, okay? Right. And, and after the uh, destruction uh, in 120 AD, where not only this, you know, this time they literally plowed Jerusalem under, built a pagan city on the top of it. Uh, Rome made it illegal for a Jew to live in Judea at all. Mm -hmm. and, and so if, if you're required to have a barley harvest in the land because... The, pro the prophetic is connected to the land, yeah. which I think is an element we forget about. Well, the rabbis couldn't get into the land and grow a barley harvest to do that, so they created an algorithm that ever so many years they would have that Adar bet to add in there, and then they they tried to simulate what it was living in Israel. But uh, I know that there are things that the government's looking at, and in fact, um, you know, I, I try to keep the 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 regular Jewish calendar. You know, I keep the feasts. Sure. But yeah. One for one reason, you have so many people that can't get off work, and if you're waiting for the sighting of the, of the new moon and all this stuff, and so you give your employer two days warning, that doesn't work. Right. And so we let's let's just let's just keep with the one that they have because it's the best of what we have now, until Israel as a whole, and I think we're probably just a few years away from them, actually returning back to a a biblical calendar of, of examining the barley harvest. Yeah. And let me tell you something, the, the uh, Muslim nations and, and the Philistine, uh, the, uh, in Philistine they, don't, they do not want them to return to that. They actually have to go out in the spring in armored vehicles to be able to inspect the barley harvest to see if it's gonna be eight or better or not. So, I mean, there are things going on in Israel with the return to that, but uh, when, when we look at the calendars, and this is this is what, I, I, this is my personal opinion. If you're trying to honor God 
and recognizing the feasts, because we don't have a solidified unified calendar that God that we can say that God has put his seal on, that God looks at our hearts. Yes, absolutely. And you know, you know, because I mean, even even among uh, let's say the 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 traditional Jewish calendar, or, or the uh, or with other with other communities, sometimes Passover will be a, a week differently. Right. You know, and so, but are are you celebrating that it was that day that Messiah gave His life for us and and recognizing it? Uh, I, I think it comes to a matter of heart. You could actually, guys, have the day right. And your heart be completely wrong if you're not careful. That's absolutely right. Yeah, and I I, I hope I, I hope I uh, explain that well in the book too because that's that's how I feel about it because I know a lot of people are are going to be tempted to want to take this calendar because there are like extra feasts and stuff. There's some really interesting stuff in there, but I I do worry that there are going to be people that are going to take that and say that you have to follow this day for day, otherwise you're not honoring God. And I I don't believe that at all. Some of the feasts, uh, some of the new feasts, like um, the Feast of New Oil, you know, we don't even know what the what the process was. We don't know what the ritual was. Uh, we don't have uh, enough fragments. We don't we don't have it explaining it. We just know that it existed. Uh, same with uh, new wine. Uh, we have a little bit more information about that, but we still don't have enough to actually be able to 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 actually do the ritual or do the the festival in the way that it was meant to be done. Um, so I, I I agree with you. God looks at our heart, and I think that you know if you look at it, appreciate it, learn from it, um, do the best you can with what you got. You know, I mean, you're not trying to dishonor God or anything. So I, I, I agree with you 100%. I think that God really looks at the heart with that kind of stuff. And even some of those feasts could be simply um, uh, things established the Essene community because it was something that God did with them. Right. And, and that, that the other ancient Jewish people may have never celebrated as far as we know. Yeah, it could be. It, it's interesting that there's some there's there's not a a direct um, like reference to it, but there's some allusions to like new wine, new oil, and the uh, the wood harvest or the wood gathering, um, where every tribe would have to bring uh, the wood offering for the altar to keep the altar burning. Um, so like in Nehemiah, it talks about the storeroom where they and it, it's interesting because they'll they'll group these together. And I never noticed this until I started looking for it. So like on the Essene calendar, the main feasts are um, wheat, barley, uh, oil and wine. Those are those four things are, are like the main kind of feasts and stuff. Well, uh, in the storeroom. Uh, well, and the wood offering, it's it, the wood offering is kind of part of uh, new oil. It's in the same week. But um, but. So those elements, those four elements, and then sometimes wood, in uh, the book of Nehemiah, those are in the storeroom, but it, it says in there, and I don't have the verse right in front, in front of me, I think it's Nehemiah 13 something, but it says in there that they had the the the, the wheat, the barley, the, the grapes, and the olives uh, for like something like as they were commanded or something, or as scripture commands, or as the Lord commanded. And when you look back though, the, in in scripture, the uh, Lord never commanded that. Uh, at, at least as far as we know, that's recorded in scripture for those four elements. Um, there, there's a, there's another example of that that I put in the book as well. Um, also, what what's interesting is in Revelation we get, uh, you know, don't hurt the oil or the wine, but but the barley and the wheat. So we get that that four grouping there too all over the old testament so it does it certainly doesn't prove that they celebrated these feasts or anything but it's an interesting connection it, it makes me wonder like i don't know if they did or not if they did what happened where it's not explained in our bible because the bible says you know describes seven feasts uh the essenes had i think 12 it, it, depending how you count it it could be 12 or 14 but either way um and it seems like that it seems like that that, that would make more sense with some of the passages say in Daniel that talks about time, times, and half a time or revelation, you know, those aren't years. Those are more Moedim cycles. So those are festival cycles. If we have seven, how do we have half of that, you know? And uh, some people might say, well, it's maybe one of the multi-day festivals. It's half of it. But if you don't complete the whole festival, then it's it's not it's not the festival. So uh, there, are, there are some things like that that make me wonder, but uh, but yeah, it's it's interesting to consider. They they may have or may not have celebrated the feast, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure which which is the right one, but it, it's interesting yeah. to think about. 
and and looking at the what we would like when we look at Passover or the week of unleavened bread, that I mean that is a very elaborate feast, and these may not have been elaborate as they were recognizing the yeah. harvest yeah. and bringing things in, which in in a sense is a part of the fall feast uh, in in a certain degree. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there, one of the things that I have heard scholars represent over the years is that there was no prohibition in Scripture for establishing a new feast if God did something significantly. That's why we have Hanukkah. Right. Uh, that's why that that's why we have Purim is because God did something very. Uh, and what's interesting is both of those also have prophetic images of Messiah interwoven through them completely. Right. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, many scholars believe that it was during this time of year, during Hanukkah, uh, that Jesus was actually conceived. And uh, of course, now scientifically, we know that when uh, that when conception happens in the womb, it literally that that very millisecond it will light up the entire womb. Yeah. So you know, we we'll talk about a festival of lights, and the light of God has come <laughs> into the world, and and all these things coalesce. And I don't necessarily see that with these other with these other feasts, but I think it was recognition of honoring God, yeah. and that these these things were there, and and they were recognizing the different aspects of the harvest that were needful for their worship of God. Yeah, definitely. And you know that's the main point behind it is that it, it, with all this stuff, and it's all over the Old Testament too. Is the main the main point is God is providing this. You know that this these things for his people. God is taking care of them and, and they're thanking him for that. You know, and it, it's, you know, it goes back to imagery like tree of, uh, tree of life and things. Uh, you know, people ask why in Revelation is there the tree of life for the healing of the nations? What What is that all about? It's not that the nations are hurt. It's that we still, we get our our, our eternity from God. We're, we're still dependent on God for that, that continuing. Now he's going to continue that eternity for us forever because he promises that but i think that's what that tree of life is and i think that in, in a way it's kind of a callback to that it's god's giving you the provisions so you know trust him thank him for it celebrate that fact and and he'll celebrate with you too and uh and so that that's really cool to see to to see that but i i totally agree i think that uh, at the heart of it that's that's the main point of, of those yeah well since you open up the door to that can i just give one thing and i'm gonna, I'm gonna let yeah. mike jump in here too yeah. Uh, lately, I mean, I just have a thousand ideas running, <laughs> and maybe it's because I'm in writing or research mode. Um, but, you know, interesting, the tree of life, and it's very succinct of, of its name, the tree of life for the healing. The very tree that Adam overlooked and would not eat of, but went after the tree of knowledge becomes the tree that becomes central to the restoration of the nations under Messiah. Amen. <laughs> and, I mean, uh, there, there, there is there is synergy, and there is balance in the word of God uh, that uh, that there, there's, you know, we as writers, the last thing we want to do is, is have this thread that we started at the beginning of the book. And when we finish the book, that thread is still dangling saying, you never dealt with me. You never dealt with me. That That's a nightmare for a writer. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> but what I'm blown away with is you have the word of God written over the, the, this very long time period by, by a whole variety of men that were inspired by God, and you get to the end. When you when you put Daniel, Jeremiah, and the book of Revelation, all this together, we get to the very end, and there's not, God leaves no thread dangling anywhere at all, and it's, it is mathematically impossible for that to happen. Yeah. Except it be a divine book. It's absolutely amazing to think about. Yeah, it's it's if that's not proof of God, I don't know what is. But a lot of people are shut off to that kind of thing, and they want to find mistakes in the Bible where mistakes don't exist. Yeah, yeah, oh, we have misunderstandings. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so so Josh, I always look at 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 books from a from a pastoral perspective as a as a Bible teacher and. How can I use this to, to, to really equip God's people to understand more fully the value, the significance, how important it is for Bible study? And I have to tell you that, that uh, as I was reading through the book, that's one of the things that came to mind because you titled the book, The Lost Prophecies. And, and so I, I, I got to the place where uh, the rule of Rome and an Essene prophecy for Herod the Great and and it's like, I define it this way, color commentary. 
you use a sports metaphor. You got the play-by-play -play call, that's the scriptures, but you got the color commentary, filling in all of the background, giving some details, the statistics, all of this, the backstory. And that's exactly what I see in this book, Josh. And, and that makes it very valuable for teachers, of whether they're a pastor, minister, whatever. If you're teaching the scriptures, you got to get this book, friends, because this is going to give you so much detail in the background that's going to bring to life. And it's actually going to connect some dots for you from this book to this book, from old to new. I think that's what we've been circling around in this conversation. It's going to connect the dots and it's going to really bring this to life. And that in itself, Josh, is worth the price of the book because that's yeah. going to encourage people. It's going to inspire people to do more study on their own. Yeah, that's what I hope. That 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 was one of the main things behind the book too that I wanted to get across. Um, and yeah, I'm 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 hoping that this can be u useful for that for context because it nothing in the Dead Sea Scrolls, at least nothing that I found. And again, people interpret things all sorts of different ways, but nothing that I've found conflicts with the Bible. All it does. It doesn't change anything in the Bible. It just adds some context. It just, like you said, it helps connect some of the dots. But really what it what it should inspire, this is what it, it, it inspired in me, was ha having having that context and have, being able to connect those dots through, uh, you know, the, the, these historical writings and um, um, see things a little clearer. It really made me appreciate the Bible even more than I than I than I knew I did or that, that I knew I could because uh, you know, again, it's it's it just adds a lot of context and it, it really helps to kind of tell the whole story of the Bible um, so that that missing 400 years isn't really missing. And, and I think that we can get a really a, a lot of context there from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yes, absolutely. Can I can I can I deal with the elephant in the room? Sure. What's okay. that? <laughs> the elephant in the room is your subtitle for the book. 12 oh, teach 25. <laughs> And the final yeah. age of man. I'm glad you asked so, about that. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, with with and don't give it all. Make them go and, and get the book and read it. But give us some cliff notes of some of the things that you discovered. Sure. So I I will say right up front, I am not predicting that the that that the and the world is going to end in 2025 or anything. There's no Dead Sea Scroll that says that. Uh, 2025 is an interesting year because if now there's contingencies, there's ifs, and I, I write about those in the book. If we're understanding the calendar correctly, if we're interpreting it correctly, um, and not just their yearly calendar, but their whole concept of time, just their concept of all of human history. You know, like we have millennia, centuries, decades, and years, but uh, they had ages, ona, unas, uh, jubilees, shemitas. Um, so if we're understanding all of that correctly, um, then it, it seems that the Essenes had this understanding of uh, the totality of human history being split up into what they call ages, and each age is uh, 2,000 years. Um, and I go, I go, it's a big complicated thing. I go, I go through it all in the book. It, I, I try to make it simple in the book so people can follow along e easily. But when you look at their calendar, it seems to say that they believe our current age will end in 2075. So why it's 2025 on the title is because that's a jubilee that's 50 years away from 2075 is 2025. And it seems like using, according to the Essenes, the previous age, uh, as comparison, the previous age would have been, their their final jubilee would have been between the years of 25 and 75 AD. So in that time, in that final 50 years, not only do you have like a great apostasy and stuff, but you also have uh, Jesus coming on the scene, his entire ministry, the birth of the church, uh, destruction of the temple. You have all these prophetic things in this, 50 year period. So in the book, I, I just question uh, if the Essenes are right, will we see a lot of prophecy be fulfilled in our final Jubilee, which would start in 2025? Could that be the final age of man as we know it before Christ returns and then we're in the uh, millennium? So uh, so I go through that more in the book. There is a lot more to it, but like you said, I don't want to give too much away. And it's for me, it was one of the most interesting things just to see how the Essenes viewed time and, and history and prophecy. And I, I thought that was really interesting. So again, you know, 
Uh, whether people believe the Essenes or not, that's that's up to each individual. But uh, it seems, if we're understanding and interpreting it right, it seems that that's what the Essenes believed. So, if if that's true, that's really interesting. <laughs> you know, and there's there tends to be this, and Mike, I want your input on this too. But there tends to be this new almost arms race uh, among those that are into eschatological studies on getting the exact day, getting the exact year right. And they will, happen. <laughs> they will fight you. Yeah. And, and one of the things I try to bring up is there is no place in the word of God that there is a special prize for the guy who guesses the year that Jesus comes back. <laughs> Amen. And and actually, like I say in the book, too, it's not even our job anyway. I mean, you know, as a point of interest or study or, 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 or to, you know, talk about where there's a larger, you know, it's a piece of a larger thing, I think it's fine. But I, I agree with you. There's a lot of people that will get hung up on this date or that date and make YouTube videos and they, they focus on the date. And it's like, well, what about that date? Like, focus on Jesus. And even Jesus said, you know, um, w when he was asked, are you going to tell us now? He said, it's not for you to know. So, and that that was right at the start of the church. Uh, I, that was like his last instruction to 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 believers. So it, it's not, we're not going to know the exact date. And we're not really going to know any of this stuff for absolute sure when it comes to like dating and stuff. Um but I, I think we can get a general idea, possibly. But even then, I, I want to be careful. Like I write in the book in the last chapter, don't don't run up your credit cards, don't sell your house, don't do all this crazy stuff, thinking that thinking that you know the end is coming in 2025. And I I say in the book, you know, if if I was if I was a betting man, um, I, I would bet nothing's going to happen in 2025. Nothing will happen in 2075 or 3075 or any date that you can imagine, because. 100% of the time that somebody has tried to put an exact date to something, it has failed. Now, maybe somebody will be right someday, uh, but I, I know I don't like those odds. So at least for me, if I, if I was a betting man, I, I I would bet nothing is gonna happen on these dates. And then if, if, if it turns out it does, hey, great, all glory to Jesus. I don't need any of the glory at all. Uh, I, I, I didn't figure any of this out anyway. So that, that's kind of how I see it. Unfortunately, there, there are a lot of church leaders and stuff that get too hung up on the dates. And, and, they, and unfortunately, you know, they fail. They kind of give the church a black eye in some, some cases. So uh, I, I hope I made that clear in the book, especially that like, look, don't, don't like, don't hinge your life on this or don't use this to define how you're going to live your life now. Like that's what Jesus is for, you know, and that, that nothing should ever take place of that. So uh, I appreciate you saying that. That's, I totally agree with you. Mike and I are old enough to remember all the crazy stuff that went on in the seventies and the eighties. Yeah. And uh, in the seventies, I was so convinced because of what all the theologians were saying within the Baptist groups that I, that I was in uh, that I never thought I would see my 20th birthday. Yeah. <laughs> and so Mikey did a lot of stupid stuff because it really wasn't going to matter. Exactly. You know, yeah. I told me the ministry, I wasn't ever going to have a chance to do it. And I sure wasn't going to be fat and old doing a YouTube a video for YouTube. OK, <laughs> none of this stuff. And I, I had I have I've had friends that uh, had free ride scholarships to their denominational seminaries and universities that turned it down because wow. they were so convinced that Jesus was going to come back shortly, that they didn't have time for an education. They went directly to the mission field. Mm -hmm. and, and then I remember the stuff back in the 80s. Jesus is coming back in 1985. So what you're supposed to do, run up them credit cards, and then we're out of here, and you're going to leave your debt to the devil. That's why all <laughs> the same bankruptcy in 1990. Yeah. Okay. All these crazy things went on, and what we've got to do, and this is something I, I had one, a uh, man of God years ago tell me, he said, listen, we we know that Jesus is coming back. And one, there's two things I can guarantee you. Number one is that we are closer to it than we were yesterday. Okay. Amen. And number two, the way to live your life is you live it as if you're going to meet with him today. But you plan for your activities in the kingdom like it's going to take you the rest of your life to accomplish it with plans to even hand it on to the next generation. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Well, Brother Mike, you know I like to cut to the quick on this kind of stuff. So I'm just going to say it plainly. We need to recapture humility yes. and point people to Jesus 
and eradicate this notion that we need clicks and we need book sales and we need notoriety or the cult of personality has so invaded yeah search that it's it's sickening and i think that's what is driving some folks not mentioning any names but some folks to be sensational in yeah. what they're putting out and i think for, for me i never want to do that i always want to want to put out content that's going to equip people and and point them to christ i don't want people to to just oh look mike's got this out now we gotta rush and get this because he's no 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 if we can get away from that then we can be a part of restoring a proper balance to the church which is what we should be interested in amen i to i totally agree we don't want people following us we want to help people follow christ and we want to follow christ too and we want to do that together Amen. Yeah, Mary and I had, uh, we're actually discussing this this morning, this kind of dives, delves beyond the book, but I think it, we're, we're all three called to ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, the last thing that we ever want is somebody putting us on a pedestal. That's right. Because I'll tell you something, I've got warts, I've got, I've got idiosyncrasies, I've got stuff that Jesus is still working on me with. Me too. Because a lot of times, a lot of the things that the sheep and the goats in the pasture are putting me through raises up ghosts of the past that I thought I had crucified, and them yep. suckers will resurrect. Okay. Oh, yeah. And and all of us are 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 in a are in a process, and and none of us none of us are perfect. In fact, we're the furthest thing from it. Uh, I, I heard one minister say, you know, you're not really doing ministry right until you get to the place that every Sunday night you're swearing that you're quitting ministry, never to look at it again. And then you pick <laughs> back up the call on Wednesday. Uh, and, you know, we, we can laugh about it because we understand that. I don't think the average person in the pew does. Right. And that uh, I stand and I know I can speak for all three of us that we look at what uh, God has accomplished through us. And I, I need to emphasize through us right. many times in spite of us yep. god has done through us we stand in absolute um awe because we know that it wasn't us and we know that the times that we're under the anointing whether to give a teaching to write a book or anything else that that anointing for those few minutes or those few months or those few hours as we're writing that anointing enables us to be the best version of us that's possible in Christ. But at the same time, we know, we know us, and we know that that is fleeting. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. So don't get the big head, right? <laughs> oh, no. Don't, don't ever get the big head, and don't ever, ever try to set up your ministry where people are setting you up on a pedestal. Because, yeah. you know, there, 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 there was something that uh, Constantine did that he, he set up a, a, a pagan idol, but it had his face on it during when he was supposed to be this Christian <laughs> emperor. And it's known as the burnt column because God blew the statue off with a bolt of lightning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, when people put you on a step pedestal, God has a tendency of blowing you off for their sake and yours. Yeah. That's and right. I, 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 yeah. I don't want to Sorry. get blown off, okay? This is let me be on the ground with everybody else, warts Amen. and all. Amen. Same here. And I've noticed that too. And I, I think that it, it kind of speaks to the times we're living in because God is cleaning house. I mean, that that happens. People don't stay on their pedestals for too long, like you said. I mean, uh, that that's why. And so many people, even people that aren't necessarily leaders in anything, they're just people on Facebook. There's so many people that are like that. I mean, just, just regular kind of people though, but trying to do that on, on Facebook. I, I largely got off of social media because I, it just got to the point where there's nothing edifying that I'm seeing. The only thing I like on Facebook is on the rare occasion somebody puts a, a Bible quote up and then nothing else, just the Bible quote. That's the only Facebook post I really like. So I'm not really on Facebook or Twitter or anything like that. I mean, I, I have the accounts, but I don't I don't really spend a lot of time on them anymore because uh, you just see you see that so much. And, and I think it speaks to just the age that we're living in. Uh, but 
it also gives uh, us and, and those watching um, who, who you know, have the eyes to pay attention to this stuff or who are willing to, um, anybody can do it. You just got to be willing to do it. But you, you can learn from those mistakes and see people do that and say, okay, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so uh, so it, it can be it can be a, a good and edifying thing. But yeah, I totally agree with you. God, God doesn't put up with that kind of stuff for, for too long. Oh, and then we need to realize modern social media, was, most of it all started with CIA seed money. That's and that right. Was a, it was a psyop for two things, to gather information on how to control you and to control your mind. And the other was to creating a platform that would be addictive, that would bring out the very worst in you. And yeah. it has succeeded in that. Absolutely. Uh, I, I've been cussed out by many a Christian on social media. Yep, me too. <laughs> and... Uh, of course, you know, Mike hadn't because he's closer to perfect than we are. And that's, that's what Kathy <laughs> No, no, no. Mike has it because I block and delete. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do, too. <laughs> yeah. I ignore. I, I, I spend about maybe two minutes uh, a week at the most, maybe sometimes not even a week, because I've got it to where whenever we post something, it automatically posts it on Facebook and on Twitter and stuff. I never have to mess with any of it. Mm -hmm. And probably so really probably about once a quarter, I'll take a look at it and say, OK, what are people arguing about now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much all it is. And and it does bring out the worst in people because typically people are not going to be like that in person. I don't know about you. I I had me. I've done a ton of conferences. I think there was only one time, maybe twice where somebody was genuinely rude to me, like for no reason, like just genuinely rude. And I, I've been I've been to a bunch of these and you know thousands, but most people are are face to face. They're 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 nice and it's fine. But what social media does is it 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 it, it takes away that um um you know just just instant reaction that you're going to have somebody from somebody speaking face to face. You know you're you're instantly accountable uh, for your words when you're speaking face to face on social media, you can drop a comment and leave and never look at it again. And you, for all, you know, that could have destroyed that other person. Typically yeah. the attitude is, well, that other person was weak. Then they shouldn't have been destroyed by that. Well, maybe they shouldn't have been, but you shouldn't have been the one to do it. Uh, so I, I, I there's that, so that much of you that. A Nietzsche, doesn't it? Doesn't that make you a Nietzschean? <laughs> that is self-interest and, and what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. I thought yeah. Most of the followers of of Christ and not Nietzsche. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Well, well, I want to share one last thing because I I know about you know when you're doing conferences and stuff, and I I had one guy rude to me too, and I we of course you meet a lot of really sweet people and stuff, yeah. and I know all yeah. of us love that. It just it makes your day. But uh, he got in, into argument with me, and it wasn't about scripture; it was about temporal mechanics. <laughs> and finally, his wife. Thank God for wives. His wife grabbed him and pulled him out of the line and says, you'll have to forgive him. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? There's something about that. There's something about the, just the topic of quantum physics. It attracts people that, that and I've, I've come across this too, people will fight with me more on quantum physics than they will on like the validity of Christianity or, or the Bible or anything like that. I think I think sometimes some people get into it because maybe they are naturally smart, but sometimes there's a pride issue with it too. <laughs> and uh, so when they see somebody else's idea or somebody else's theory, they take it as like a, a personal offense, like a challenge, because that that's what they pride in themselves that they're smart enough to you know understand this or something. I'm not saying everybody's like this, but I think you know a few of them that get aggressive about it. I think that's partly why I think it's a pride deal. But yeah, I've come across a couple of those too. <laughs> They forget the lesson that Einstein, when he was when he was teaching, and uh, his second year physics students, uh, his assistant asked him, "What what questions are we going to ask this year for the final exam?" And he says, "Same ones as last year," and the guy said, "No, no, they already know all the answers." He says, "No, they don't because all the answers have changed <laughs> because <laughs> in, in, in physics and in, in in all these different areas, they are they are so evolving, they're so developing, and they're they're." For if you're dealing with one subject, there's 900 opinions. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's worse than when preachers get together trying to figure out when the rapture is going to happen, okay? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's worse than that. And so you get in that one red, you think, boy, I have found this. And then you find out, oh, yeah. And everybody else thinks he was a weirdo in the science community. <laughs> <laughs> And sometimes that's actually a badge of honor because it was the weirdos that eventually end up being proven right many times. Yeah, yeah Same thing with medicine. 
you know, and, and guys, well, while we're, while we're dealing with these issues, and we know the Lord's coming as soon, we, we don't know exactly what's going to happen in America. Uh, I think that there's some things that we're going to have to fight through, simply because Marxism has gotten such a hold. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not writing off America. I'm not writing off a lot of things. I don't think we're there yet, okay? Uh, we it, it, it's time for us to press into the kingdom. We're constantly looking for new information, and at the same time, we have to maintain hope and a good sense of humor. Amen. Uh, through all this. Amen. Mike, anything you want to add before we close today? Nope. I just appreciate uh, both of you, brothers, and and uh, the ministries, the assignments that the Lord has given to you. They are edifying and equipping the body. So thank you. Well, thank both of you. I really appreciate the invite. Uh, always love talking to you both, and thank you for both of your ministries as well. And then hope everybody enjoyed this because what you saw today was three old friends getting together. That's right. Talking about and uh, keep looking up, keep looking to the Word. And one unique thing, the Word of God, and John tells us this: if we're looking for Jesus coming, it causes us to purify ourselves. And yeah. Lord knows yeah. we need to be purified before he returns. And Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would release that in our lives, yes. that we yes. would seek after him, throw off mystery Babylon, and walk the kingdom in this generation. Amen. And Father, we thank Amen. you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name.